Good morning again. Over the past couple of weeks, we have been looking at the traits or the characteristics of true discipleship. And this morning, we want to bring that kind of to a, a conclusion. Now, Theodora Roosevelt once said, There has never yet been a man who led a life of ease whose name is worth remembering. And certainly, when we think about the calling on our life to be disciples of Jesus Christ, we need to understand that Jesus is not calling us to a life of comfort or ease. He's calling us to a life of dedication, a life of commitment, a, a, a life of, of self-sacrifice. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 10 this morning. In at verses uh, 34 through 42. But before we do that, I want to tell you who has meant a lot to me. Um, his story I find very inspiring. April 18th, 1942, Corporal Jacob DeShazer, Charles Raiders, was the B 25 here on the last plane to the aircraft carrier USS. They were on a bombing mission to avenge the attack on Pearl Harbor. The plan was to bomb the Japanese capital, Tokyo. To show that they were not um, out of reach of American bombers. Jacob grew up in a Christian home, but he really didn't feel like the Bible or church was much for him. He, like all the members of Doolittle's raid, Raiders, had volunteered for this mission. But as he neared the coast of Japan, he also began to think about the fact that um, he, he might not live through this, this ordeal. Prior to takeoff, his plane had been damaged. There was a hole in the fuel slage, which caused the plane to slow down, and it used up more fuel than had, and they had anticipated. Their target was a city called Nagoya, which was just south of Tokyo. And they successfully bombed an oil refinery, a gasoline storage facility, and a factory. Then they headed for the safety of the part of China that was still under Allied control. But because of the damage to the airplane, the plane ran out of fuel. And as a result, they had to jump out of, they had to parachute from their plane over occupied China. The entire crew was taken prisoner by the Japanese and put into a where they were for 30 months. Now, not begin to imagine the um, difficulty of being a prisoner of war at, at that point in time. Now, not surprisingly, Jacob became a very bitter man. He witnessed... Um, the, the torture and the killing of many of his, his friends. Um, it was not uncommon for the, the prisoners you know, to die, obviously, of starvation and disease, but they were also bayoneted and, and decapitated. Now, while in May of 1944, while Jacob was in solitary confinement, somebody smuggled him a Bible. He kept it hidden from the guards for three weeks. And during that time, he read it every opportunity that he could. Also, there was a fellow prisoner, Lieutenant Robert Meter, who died in captivity. But before his death, he had been a very strong witness for Jesus Christ in Jacob's life. Now, while Jacob was in solitary confinement, the witness of his friend Robert Meter and also from reading in the Bible, the Holy Spirit really began to work in Jacob's life. And on you know, June 8th, 1944, while in captivity in solitary confinement, he trusted Christ as his Savior. Before his release on August 20th, 1945, he had had a complete change of heart. No longer was he angry 
angry and full of vengeance toward the Japanese, he began to find a, a deep-seated love for them. And he had already determined that when the war was over, he was going to Japan to, to tell them about Jesus Christ. After the war, he got married, and he and his wife would serve the next 30 years in Japan. On December 8, 1948, six years and eight months after he boarded the USS Hornet to bomb Japan, DeShazer and his wife boarded the USS General Miggs to deliver Bibles. Now, one more amazing story is that one of the things that DeShazer did was he created a tract that told his, his story, his testimony in Japanese. And these were, were spread out throughout all of Japan. One of the men who read his track was a, a man by the name of Mitsu Fushida. And he, was, uh, he became a Christian. Now you think, well, why is that important? Mitsu Fushida was the lead pilot who led the attack on Pearl Harbor. And he and DeShazer became best friends, and they served together and ministered together many, many years as, as co-laborers for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, what we are looking at is the story of discipleship. This is the story of commitment. And in, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 38, Jesus says, He who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Discipleship is all about commitment. It's about dedication. It's about self-denial, self-sacrifice, cross-bearing. This is what authentic discipleship looks like. Now, there are many, many people who claim to be followers of Jesus, many who claim to be his disciples. But here, Jesus is pointing to us what genuine discipleship looks like. He, he's, he's helping us see the difference between false and real. And, and for Jesus, this is essential. This is a theme that comes up over and over in Jesus' teachings. If you go, for instance, to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, Jesus says you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and the gate is wide and many will choose to go that way. What Jesus is saying is that there are two roads that seem to lead to eternal salvation. There are two roads that seem to lead to God. But only one of them is the authentic way. Only one of them is the true way. So make sure you are on the right trail. Over and over again, this comes up in Jesus' teaching. We have the parable of the sower and the seeds. We have it in our stained glass here. I told the folks in the first service, if you get to daydreaming, that's something you can look at. Um, I, I think that's why stained glass was put in churches, so that when people daydream, they you know, they're just like, yeah, okay. Now, Jesus points out in his parable of seeds that there are four soils. There's the hard soil, the thorny soil, the rocky soil, and the fertile soil. Out of all of those soils, only one of them produces results. Only one of them leads to salvation. What we need to hear is that it's much easier to miss the way of salvation than it is to find the way of salvation. And so when Jesus talks over and over and over again about the path that leads to salvation, when he talks about true discipleship, we need to hear what he's saying. Don't be surprised that, that Jesus keeps bringing this up. And that's where, exactly where we are in Matthew chapter 10. Jesus is giving us the traits of a genuine disciple. Now, at, at this passage, what 
just this is a real brief review. The, what Jesus is doing is he is preparing his disciples to send them out to minister. And what he's doing is he's giving them the characteristics, the, the traits of true discipleship. And, and what he tells them is, is that a true disciple, first of all, is going to look and act and speak and, and conduct themselves as Jesus conducted himself. So if you are an authentic follower of Christ, your life should be on a, on a trend of becoming more and more and more like Jesus Christ. That's the goal. That's the ambition. And if your life is not on that track, you've got a problem. There's something amiss. Now, the problem is, is the more you become like Christ the more the world is going to treat you like they treated Jesus. And so he's preparing his disciples for that. He's trying to help them to understand that as they become more like him, they're going to be treated like he is treated. And when that happens, we need to be prepared for that. And so he says, don't be, don't be afraid of the world. Because the world is going to treat you harshly when you become like I, I become. Now, jumping down to verse 34, where we're getting into our text today, Jesus says, now don't think or don't be under the, the misunderstanding that I came to bring peace. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Now, this is a very dramatic statement. Jesus causes division. That's what we need to understand. He forces people to make a decision which causes, causes separation. The very fact that some people confess Jesus and other peoples reject Jesus tells us that there is going to be division, that there is going to, to, to be a, a splitting that occurs. And Jesus builds on that. Now, the Jews understood the, the concept of peace. Um, in Isaiah 9, it tells us that the Messiah will be the prince of peace. So Jesus comes along and he says, don't think that we're just looking at peace here. We're also need, we need to understand that I've not come to bring peace, but I've come to bring sword. What he's saying is, on the one hand, I am the Prince of Peace. I am the Messiah. But on the other hand, there's going to be conflict. And the Old Testament actually shows this. We're going to be looking here um, at, at what Jesus says. He quotes from My Micah chapter 7, verse 6. Jesus says, or, or excuse me, Micah 7, 6 says, The son dishonors the father, the daughter rises up. Against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are from his own house. What, what this is all pulling together is in the Old Testament, we see the Messiah as the Prince of Peace. But we also see the Messiah as someone that comes to bring conflict, that brings a separation. And we see that even today. Uh, there are those people who when they, when they think about Jesus or they look to Jesus, all they want to do is focus on Jesus, how much Jesus loves us, which he does, how much he cares about us, which he does, how he forgives us, which he does. We, we want to focus on that, but we can't forget, we can't throw out the fact that Jesus is also the just judge that Jesus is the one who is going to rule with an iron rod, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Jesus is Lord. You can't have it one way and not the other. And we need to understand this. So, so what Jesus is saying is that don't be under any illusion that when you go out as a disciple, don't think everyone's just going to go, oh, yes, I want to be a follower of Jesus because he loves us so much. The fact is that there are going to be people who reject 
you and reject your message. And we need to be prepared. So yes, the Lord brings peace, but He also brings a sword. Remember when the angels came and proclaimed Jesus' birth, they said, peace on earth. And in John 14, Jesus says, my peace I give to you. Well, and even the Apostle Paul talks about the fact that, um, that God gives us peace. So this is what we need to understand. When we commit our life to Jesus Christ, when we surrender our will to Him, the Bible says that we have peace with God. And when a person is right in their relationship with God, they are at peace. So if you are a disciple, you understand that I am at peace with God. I am in harmony with God. But because you're in harmony with God, that automatically is going to cause you to be in conflict with the world. So we need to recognize that. We need to understand that. Everything's not just going to be all rosy and hunky-dory all the time. There's going to be conflict. If you're a disciple of Jesus, you must be okay with the fact that there's going to be conflict, even if it's in your own home. That's what Jesus is leading us to. You don't want to be at odds with people. You certainly don't want to be at odds with your own family. But if you're going to be a genuine follower of Christ, you're willing to say, my commitment to Jesus is greater even than my commitment to my family. Verse 35, for I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. What he's, he, he's telling us is that we are going to be at odds. It's going to happen. Now, it's okay. It's not okay, but it's, it's easier to handle when we find ourselves at odds with a neighbor or someone we work with, or something like that, we can kind of deal with that because you go home at the end of the day and, and you don't have to deal with it. When it's in your own home, all of a sudden that becomes much more difficult. That, that, that's now very personal. And what Jesus is telling us is that's going to happen. And we need to understand that. Remember in Luke chapter um, this guy comes up to Jesus and he says, hey, I want to be your follower. I want to be one of your disciples. But before I do, I need to go home and tell my family goodbye and let them know what I'm doing. And Jesus says, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom. What Jesus is telling that guy and what he's communicating to us is, not going to accept you because you're too attached to your family. You're never going to be willing to make the break. You're never going to be willing to pay the price. And, and that we see that play out because there will be spouses who aren't willing to either commit to Christ or aren't willing to serve Christ because they don't want to create problems at home. There are children who won't commit to Christ or, or serve Him because they're, they're afraid of how mom or dad might react. People who are not willing to take a stand for Christ because they're wanting to maintain family harmony are not fit for the kingdom. That, that's what Jesus is telling us. A true disciple has to be willing to forsake their family. Now, that, that's a harsh message, and I, I, I get that. When I was in India and, and we went up to Nepal, I had an opportunity to meet some Sherpas. And if you don't know what a Sherpa is, when people climb Mount Everest... The Sherpas are the ones that get them all of the way up to the very top and then step back so that these people can get the glory of going to the very top. 
The Sherpas are the ones that carry all the equipment and do all of the work. And then they get the people up there and they're, they live up there. That, that's, that's their home. Well, some of these Sherpas I had the opportunity to meet are followers of Christ. And one of the individuals in particular that stood out in my, stands out in my mind, when he was 13 years old, he accepted Jesus Christ. And his family and his village turned on him because he accepted Christ. And they drove him out of the village. And for three years, he lived in the forest. He basically had to exist on his own. And, and after those three years, he finally went to another place where he was able to live with a missionary and, and have a roof over his head. But for three years, he lived in the woods, beginning at the age of 13. That's what Jesus is talking about here. Accepting Christ, even if it means costing you your family connections. Now, it doesn't have to be that way, and, and I, I thank God for that. But when it comes, if it comes, we have to be willing to make that commitment. Now, what we're really talking about is Jesus as our Lord. Being a Christian is affirming your commitment to his lordship over your life. You know, we have, we have watered down to say, well, you know, if you just put your hand up, if you just sign a card, if you just pray a prayer, everything's great. And that's not true. Jesus is calling us to make a, a commitment, even if it cost us our family. Of course you love your family. Of course you love your children, you know, your parents, your husband, your wife. Uh, of course. But what Jesus is telling us is, in comparison to your love for your family, your love for Jesus has to be greater. Now, some of you I know have had to make that type of choice before. By, by confessing Jesus as your Savior, it has cost you Family relationships. People don't want anything to do with you anymore. And I'm sorry that you've had to go through that. But the reality is, is that's what genuine faith looks like. You know, if someone says, I'm not willing to make that sacrifice, Jesus is saying, then you are not a genuine follower. In verse 36, it says, a man's enemies will be those of his own household. In other words, when the sword that Jesus came to bring falls, sometimes it's going to fall in our homes. It's going to separate families. And verse 37 takes it the next step. He who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves a son or a daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He's saying, you can't be my disciple. You cannot be my follower if your commitment to your loved ones is more than your commitment to me. Now, there's something that all of us probably love more than our own family, more than our own children, more than our own, our own parents. And, and it's typical of human nature. We love ourselves. And that's what Jesus gets to next. You know, a lot of people might be willing to say, well, okay, I, I can give up my family. I, I can give up my kids or, or my husband or my wife, but I don't know about giving up my life. Verse 38, who does not take, his take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. That's the whole point that Jesus is, is stressing here. It's easy, you know, to, to, to sit here in an air-conditioned, comfortable building and say, yeah, I'm a follower of Jesus. But what about when it starts costing us? What about when it starts taking our family from us? Now, what about when it costs us our very life? For you to be able to say, 
I would choose death for your sake, Jesus, rather than life for my sake. That's what Jesus is asking us. Now we're getting real here. Verse 38, he who does not take his cross, take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. What is your cross? These people knew immediately. His disciples understood perfectly what Jesus was talking about. The Romans were very harsh. They didn't mess around. If you made them mad, if you crossed them, if you did something they didn't like, they didn't hesitate. They would nail you to a cross. And to be crucified was the most horrible death, I think, that humanity has ever come up with. It's long. It can take days to even weeks to die on a cross. It is a slow, painful, excruciating death. And so these disciples had seen crucifixion. What the Romans would do is they would crucify people out on the public pathways so that everybody saw it. Everybody knew. These were not hidden away in some back alley. These were public. And so when Jesus says, if you're not willing to take up your cross immediately, the disciples understood he's talking about death, plain old dying. And he's saying that you've got to be willing to die rather than deny me. And so, so when, when Jesus is saying this, he's setting a standard that we need to understand. Now, again, here in America, at this point in our history, it's not costing us to be followers of Christ like Jesus is describing. But we need to be prepared and we need to, in our minds, say, I would be willing. Committing our life to follow Jesus Christ means that we're not only willing to be you know, committed to following him, but we're willing, if necessary, to walk away from our family. And we're willing, if called on, to even lose our life. That's what a genuine follower of Jesus looks like. And then he adds uh, this thought in verse 39. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Now, what, is, what does he mean by that? In essence, by, by making sure that we are physically safe well, in order to protect ourselves by denying Jesus, then we are, in essence, throwing out our eternal, our, our eternal salvation. By securing one's physical safety, we're in order to, to maintain um, our, our life, but by doing that, we're, we're denying or rejecting Jesus, then we are showing Jesus that we are not followers at all. If you're trying to hang on to your life to make sure you don't ever get too hot, you don't ever get too, too invested. You know, boy, I, I'm not willing to make that kind of sacrifice. I, you know, that, that, that's, that's too much. Uh, that's, not, that's not realistic. Uh, you know, if, if that's our mindset, Jesus is saying, you're not worthy of me. You are not my follower. By finding your life, by, by, by seeking to secure your physical life through saying, well, I and not to be a follower of Jesus until the pressure's off, and then I'll go back to following him. Jesus says, I don't want anything to do with you. You are not one of mine. But if you're willing to lose your life for Jesus, then you're willing, then you will find eternal life in the end. Now, I want to make a, a clear statement here. This doesn't mean that by being a martyr, you get salvation because we are not saved by works. We're saved by grace. It is a gift from God. But what it means is that if you're a genuine Christian, you're willing to die if necessary. Now, 
the, the issue really is here is one who confesses Jesus Christ and who dies because of that is far better off than an apostate who maybe escapes death in this life by denying Christ, but in the end, they receive eternal damnation. Now, to kind of bring it down, you're better off to not be comfortable. You're better off to be hated by the world. It's better to lose your family. It's even better to lose your life than to forsake Jesus Christ. That's, that's the bottom line. Now, again, at this point in our, our lives, we're not being asked to do that. But we need to be prepared. We need to have the mindset that, Jesus, I, will, I am willing if necessary. Now, verse 40 says, He who receives you receives me, and he who receives, uh, he who receives me receives him who sent me. A true disciple is, in addition to, yes, causing some, some splits, causing some, some breaks, is going to also have a positive effect. When we, when we go out and we preach the message of Jesus Christ, when we are faithful to Him in the way we live, there are going to be people who do not respond to us in a good way. But there are also going to be people who say, I want to hear more of the message that you have to speak. And, 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 and that's what He's telling us here. That in verse 40, if He receives you, they're receiving Christ. If they receive your message about Jesus, then they're receiving just Jesus as well. Now, verse 41 says, He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a prophet, a righteous man receives a righteous man's reward. It really helps if I can read. Um, what, what this is saying is it, it doesn't matter if it's a pastor, a teacher, a missionary, an evangelist, anyone who represents Jesus Christ, when you receive that person, you also receive the reward that that person is being given. So I'm preaching the message of Christ to you and, 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 and the message of Jesus to you. And so if I receive any reward for what I'm doing, you also will receive the same reward that I am being given. That, that's what Jesus is saying here. Just by sitting here. Isn't that great? It's like in school when you, you just got an A for showing up. You know, the, uh, the, that, that, that's kind of how this, this works. And then verse 42, whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. What he's talking about here, a, a little one, he's talking about a young disciple, a, a new Christian. And so what Jesus is saying is, you're not going to just be rewarded if you have some big fancy person show up. You know, if Billy Graham were still alive and he showed up, you know, we'd be like, ooh, wow, isn't that great? But, but Jesus is saying, even if it is a new Christian, if you extend to them mercy, if you, sh you show them love by just giving them a glass of water, then you're, you're saying that you shall by no means lose the reward. You're, you're going to be blessed. You're going to be rewarded even by ministering and supporting the least of Jesus' kingdom. A disciple then is a, is a person who has a hand in determining destiny. Think about that. When you carry out the message of Jesus Christ, either in your life or by the words that come out of your mouth, people are going to have their eternal destiny impacted because of what you are doing. And so you receive a righteous reward for doing that. And those people will receive a righteous reward for doing that. 
And so you are, you are being blessed and they are being blessed. Being a disciple of Jesus Christ is a fantastic thing. It is a good thing. Yes, you become the source of conflict in, in people's lives, even maybe in your own family. But you are being a blessing as well. And God is going to reward you for your faithfulness. Now, we are the line in the sand. It is up to us to be the ones who take the message of Jesus Christ. We, to be a disciple, have to stand up. We have to be counted. We have to be committed. We can't pass the buck to anybody else and say, well, anyone else is If you are an authentic follower of Christ, you have to get involved and be a part of this. Let's pray. Now, as your eyes are closed and heads bowed, I would just ask that in your own heart, you make a, a commitment or a recommitment to Christ to be a, a more committed follower. All of us fail. All of us fall short. All of us mess up. And so we are so thankful for God's grace and His mercy. But He calls us to make a commitment. And I just, I encourage you this morning to renew that commitment. If, if you've never made that commitment, then do it today. And say, God, I give you everything that I am. Earlier we sang, I surrender all. And all means your failures as well as your successes. All means all. Did you mean that as you sang that? Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning and we thank you that you gave us the perfect picture of what genuine looks like. You are everything. And our God, our, our goal, our ambition needs to be to allow you absolute control in our lives so that we emulate you more perfectly. Help us, Father, to be your true disciples. Not to, to just give you lip service to sell out 100%. Thank you, Father. Help each person in this room and everybody that's, that's watching online. Help each of us, Lord, to honestly evaluate our lives. Make an honest commitment to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.